morning, everybody. Great to see you. So many people here last night for service, so many families and kids stuck around for the big FM Live event. I was surprised this room was going to be able to recover. Um, there, was, there was a lot of mess to, to clean up. Um, let me ask you a question to kick us off this morning. Have you ever found yourself extremely thirsty? You, you know, the basic definition of thirsty is to have an uncomfortable feeling because you need something to drink, right? So have you ever found yourself uncomfortably thirsty? Right? Maybe you're out working in the yard on a hot summer day. Maybe if you're a runner, it's that seventh or eighth mile of a long jog, and you find yourself uncomfortably thirsty. If you have little kids, have they ever like come up to you and said, like, Dad, I'm dying of thirst? Like, right? You ever have that? They're out playing in the yard on a hot summer day, and a whole herd of them come into your kitchen. We're dying of thirst, right? And if you've got ice water or lemonade, or maybe you've got popsicles in the freezer, you, you, you get them some of that, some lemonade. You know, when I grew up, there was a kid sort of behind me. He had the one sort of long and flat yard in the neighborhood. So it was where all the football games and baseball games would, would take place. And I remember, like, playing down there, and you'd get all hot on a summer day, and, and you'd go into his kitchen and say, like, hey, we're, we're dying of thirst here, right? And his mom, I, I remember she would say, well, there's a garden hose on the side of the house. If you want something to drink, go get a drink from the hose, right? Anybody else ever been told that? Like, that's awful. Any, anybody ever drink from a garden hose? Like, you truly need to be dying of thirst because it's disgusting. It tastes like a hose. Is that's what it tastes? I never really liked that kid's mom. <laughs> In fact, um, she was the mom that wished to hand out toothbrushes on Halloween. Who, who does that? One year, pencils. She gave us pencils on, on Halloween. You know, may or may not have caused her house to have a few eggs thrown at it, right? And you can go clean that off of your garden hose, right? Being thirsty is one thing, right? But being dehydrated can be quite serious if you don't drink something, right? There's a difference between thirsty and, and dehydration. You know, I looked this up. Some of the basic signs to tell if you maybe are on the verge of being dehydrated is one, I just, I found this funny, it's bad breath. It says that if you're dehydrated, it might be, that if you have bad breath, it might be that you're, that you're dehydrated. Also, it says headaches or, or body aches are a sign that, that you're dehydrated. Fatigue, your eyes become so dry they cannot produce tears. And then eventually, you get lightheaded, disoriented, and if you don't get something to drink, you could faint. Have you ever gotten to that point? See, I think most times with, between thirsty and dehydration, we don't realize we're, we're dehydrated until maybe the lightheadedness set, sets in and we need to like sort of sit down. And, and then we get, I can recall a couple times, you know, maybe working out too hard or too long, and I, and I just sensed it, like, man, I need to sit down, I need to hydrate, I need to get something to drink. You know, there's another definition of the word thirsty, right? So, in addition to just needing something to drink, it also can mean to have a strong desire. You know this, right? But like, a strong desire for something, you're thirsty. You're thirsty for knowledge. You're thirsty for change. You're, you're thirsty for answers. So today we kick off our, our Christmas series called Choose Christmas, and I want to just ask you a simple question. Are you thirsty for God this Christmas season? And I'm not asking you if you're thirsty for the Christmas season, right? Because for some of you, indeed, this is the most wonderful time of the year, right? You just love this. And for others, though, maybe the shopping and the decorating and the traveling and all that has you even overwhelmed at this season. So my question is not, are you thirsty for Christmas time? My question is, are you thirsty for God this Christmas time? And in essence, that, that's the, the, the question that's in the summary of this series. You saw it in that little video right before I popped up, right? This December, will you choose to journey, to pursue, to choose Christmas? See, when you're thirsty or you desire something... You know, you have to choose to pursue it. So if you're thirsty for knowledge or answers, you got to go on a journey to find them. You have to choose to quench that thirst. So, so here's, here's sort of a big statement. When it comes to being thirsty for God, I believe that some of us, maybe in this room today, are dehydrated. And you are not even aware of it. You, you have gone about exhausting yourself by running in so many different directions, 
that you've actually possibly distanced yourself from God without even being aware of it. Well, what are the symptoms of soul dehydration? Well, I think they're very similar to the ones I just went through. One of them, I think, is bad breath. What's coming out of your mouth this Christmas season? C can, I just, can you just gauge it? Is what's coming out of your mouth more encouraging or discouraging? Bad breath. What's coming out of your mouth, is it more criticism or praise? I, I think body aches, it's, it says, is a symptom of dehydration. You know, I often talk about this at Christmas time. I use this phrase, the eternal ache. And I think in this season, sometimes we can experience like an ache. And it's this knowing that something is missing. That something just isn't right. And our soul, I think it's our soul, it's the Imago Dei, the image of God inside of us aching. We know that things are not the way they're supposed to be. And sometimes at Christmas time, that awareness to this image of God inside of us, this ache for things to be whole, I think it's a sign of, of, of potentially dehydration. And another sign is fatigue, right? So are you exhausted? And I don't just mean physically. How about relationally? How about spiritually? It says that, you know, a symptom of dehydration is your dry eyes and you can't produce tears. So can I ask you just a question? Have you lost your compassion for people? Do you just really not have any empathy or tears for those in need uh, around you? And then lastly, lightheadedness and, and disorientation. Are you just in a spot right now where it just seems like everything is spinning around you? You're literally feeling disoriented. So I'll say this again. When it comes to being thirsty for God, I believe some of us are dehydrated and we're not even aware of it. Do you know one of the worst things to drink when you are on the verge of dehydration? Soda or pop, right? It, th that sugar and, and that caffeine, caffeine, right? It, it's sweet, and what happens is our body, it diverts all of its energy then, for on the verge of dehydration, our body diverts its energy to, to break down the sugar and, and the caffeine instead of absorbing the much-needed water. And, and I, I use this as an illustration. I love the sweetness and the traditions of Christmas. And I, I love the trees and the lights and, and the gift giving. I love me some Santa and his reindeer and all that stuff. I love it. But if your relationship with God is dehydrated going into this season, those traditions, that sweetness is only going to divert energy away from the real issue. And what's going to happen on December 26, when you pack up all that sweetness and all those traditions, you're going to find yourself empty and wanting and possibly feeling lost. So could it be that this thirst, this desire, this need and this knowing that something is missing is actually a thirst for God? It is somehow inside you. In the same way our body begins to ache and becomes disoriented without water, could our souls actually begin to ache and become disoriented without God? I really believe that to be true. I, I've experienced it. And I believe some of you might be experiencing that right now and not even realize it. So will you choose Christmas this season? Will you choose to pursue, to journey to the heart of Christmas? See, we're going to focus on four aspects of, of, of God throughout this series. And I believe if you choose them this Christmas season, you can quench your thirst. You really can. I, I want to just start off with a scripture. It's, it's a common scripture read around this time of, this, of the year. It's found in Matthew 2, verse 1. It says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. So folks, as Mary was giving birth to Jesus in Bethlehem, a group of wise men, sometimes referred to as magi, you know, was set out on a journey to pursue a messiah. A Lord, a King of the Jews that was about to be born. And what do we know about these wise men? Well, we don't really know much. We, the text says they were a group of men that traveled from the east in search of a king. In the nativity set, there are often three of them, right? But it never says there's three. 
We just sometimes associate that maybe because there were three gifts. Truth is, we know very little. They came from the east, which means most likely they came from Babylon, Persia, or Arabia, which means this, got to get a hold of this, means their journey was probably 700 to 900 miles. And this would have been almost unheard of at this time. People didn't make these kind of journeys. They would have had to spend a lot of time in preparation and gathering provision. They would have needed to hire security. They would have most likely needed to sort of send letters and reach out to the nation in which they were going to pass through and ask for permission to do so. And from Matthew's account, it's clear that they must have had some limited knowledge about Jewish messianic beliefs. Now, I'm going to do some Old Testament prophecy nerd out stuff here, so stay with me, okay? Because I want you to try to grasp what it was that might have inspired these men to make this journey in search of a king. This actually, it could make sense that they had some knowledge because east of Jerusalem at this time, there were significant Jewish populations that were there. And why were they there? Because centuries before, when Israel was conquered, those folks were banished and exiled to the east. And some of them, even after they had permission to return back to their homeland, they remained there. The wise men must have had acquired some knowledge from these folks about a messiah, about a savior, about a Lord that was to be, to be born and become king of the Jews. And this knowledge, it would have been available to these wise men from those regions. They could have read ancient documents. They could have simply been told stories by the folks there, stories that are found in like the book of Daniel or, or, or the prophecies of, of Micah or Isaiah. And when they saw a particular star, star rise, they had a deep desire, a thirst, to go find this Messiah and just even see if it could possibly be true. Various commentaries and some of my reading have prompted me to sort of think that I, I think there's one key text that I believe might have been something that they came across, that they saw, that desired that when they saw the star, they were going to make the journey. And it's found in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. And it's sort of like a, it, it's a little known, often, often not quoted passage from a, from a prophet Balaam. And it says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, he's talking about this Messiah that's coming, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Sire, also his enemy shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of the city. Had these wise men maybe been told or read the clear prophecy, be, prophecy about a star that would rise out of Jacob, a scepter out of Israel, the coming messianic ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, stay with me here. Did they have an understanding of Israel's future deliverer that would be indicated by a star and that it would bring victory over enemies and victory to all people? See, at this time of Balaam's prophecy, some people may have thought when they read this that it was already fulfilled through King David, right? That, but these words, they, they reach beyond King David. And why do I know that? Because just in a few verses earlier, his prophecy is talking about in days to come. And that phrase is very key. Because in days to come is the theology of eschatology. It's the, it's the theology of death and judgment and sort of the final destiny of the soul of mankind. In days to come, reaches beyond a mortal king and it reaches out to a divine savior. That somehow these wise men made a decision to see if this star was indeed a signal of his birth. So they traveled. They reached Jerusalem. Herod pulls them to, in, and other religious leaders are sort of, and there's a lot of confusion and deception, if you know this part of the story. But they see the star again. And Matthew records it this way. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opened their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The, these Men, folks, they, 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 were, they were Gentiles, right? They were not believers. But somehow, in some way, they heard about a Savior, and they became thirsty, and they desired to pursue the truth. In Jerusalem, once they got there after this massive journey, 
They were, they were deceived and confused, but they went the six more miles and found Jesus, and they believed, and they praised him and worshiped him. My guess is there's some folks here today that, that you didn't grow up in Christian homes. You didn't go or grow up maybe in believing homes. But somehow, some way along your journey, you, you've heard about Jesus, right? You've heard about a Savior. Maybe a trusted friend told you about his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection. And it's caused you to wonder, could this be true? Maybe dur during your journey, you've just seen something in nature, like a sunset or uh, the beauty of an ocean or the stars in the skies. And, and it's just caused you to, to, to wonder to yourself, like, clearly, th this couldn't have just happened by some random collision in the, in the atmosphere, right? Maybe for you, it's something like, like the birth of your child. Maybe for you, it's, it's one time in your life you threw up one of those, if you're, if you're real God, prayers. And he undeniably seemed to have answered it, and that left you wondering, could this be true? Maybe you are thirsty, and maybe you have that ache that something is missing. And if that's you, if, if I sort of described you in any way there, hear me on this, choose Christmas. Walk that six more miles and find that boy, Jesus. There's another familiar Christmas story, right? We'll, we'll probably use this a few more times in, in this sermon series. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and it says this. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, with that angel, there was a whole host and multitude of heavenly angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Folks, the, these shepherds, they, they were Jewish, most likely Jewish shepherds, tending sheep somewhere just outside of the little town of Bethlehem, Right? We actually know quite a bit about shepherds from this time. Much has been studied and written about them. They, they, were, they were people that were not of good character, right? They, they, they were not widely trusted. It was said at this time that you would never purchase anything from a shepherd because you would assume that it was stolen. So, so this job was, was a really low-paying job. It's a job as a shepherd that no one wanted. It's on the bottom of the economic food chain. They were doing it most likely because it was the only employment that they could obtain. And I'm not going to pull this whole story apart, but I just want to make sure that we at least catch the scene. In the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, the glory of God shines on them. And an angel heralds to them the good news of a long-awaited Savior that has just been born. And the angels proceed to tell them exactly where they can find this Savior. And then the night goes silent again. And they have a choice, right? What do they do? It says, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the sayings that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these things pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was told, been told before them. These men were, were Jews. Most likely, they knew the story of God in great detail. If they were Jewish shepherds, they would have known the stories of Father Abraham, of a great nation that was to be formed. They would have known the stories of Moses setting his people free. They would have known the stories of David and Goliath. They would have known the prophecy of a Savior to come, born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. However, knowing all that, though, they still had a decision to make. Would they journey just those couple miles or less, maybe within an hour, to go and see for themselves? And they did just that, just like the angel told them and like the wise men found they found Jesus. 
So maybe like shepherds in this room today, some of you who have grown up in believing or Christian homes, and, and frankly, you, you know all the stories, right? You, you might have a, a sash full of Sunday school attendance badges, right? It did the youth group thing. Yet somewhere along the way, maybe you found yourself here today feeling really far from God. Maybe you never made, you know, your parents' story or your youth leader's story about Jesus your story. Maybe along the way you've made some really lousy decisions and it's distanced you from God. Or maybe you think because of those decisions that you're too far away for God to ever care. Maybe you've been deceived by someone along the way. But maybe your pursuit of happiness has really left you empty. Maybe you know something is missing. And if that describes you in any way today, please hear me say this. Choose Christmas this season. For you, man, the journey back is so short. Those shepherds most likely walk less than an hour to, to, to find a Savior. Take that journey. Quench that thirst. Those wise men and those shepherds chose Christmas and found a Savior. And this series has been formed around four themes. If you choose Christmas, you will find a Savior. And through Him, you can experience these four gifts. Next week, Pastor Kent is going to talk about the gift of forgiveness. In week three, I'll be back to talk about the gift of joy. Kent will conclude this series on Christmas Eve with the gift of freedom. And today... I want to assure you that through Jesus, you can receive the gift of healing. And for you, maybe it's spiritual healing, that your soul is dry and you thirst today for spiritual healing. Maybe you feel like God has let you down, or, or maybe the church has, and it's created some kind of disconnect between you and God. God can heal that. He desires to heal that in you. Maybe for you, it's a, a need of relational healing, right? Right? That, that you've been just so wounded by someone or some people that it's left you not trusting God. He can heal that. He wants to heal that in you today. Maybe for you it's, it's physical or, or emotional healing that you need. The doctor's report was not good. The physical struggle, whatever it is that you've been dealing with, whether it's big or small, just does not seem to want to relent. Maybe for you it's emotional healing, the anxiety or the stress, the loneliness, grief. It's the waves of sadness that just won't seem to cease. There's healing available for that today. See, we don't, we don't serve a God that remained on his throne in heaven feeling sorry for us. We serve a God that vacated heaven to find us, born in a manger, being fully God yet fully human, he walked among us. He experienced dry and desert moments. He, he experienced this incredible spiritual ache, just like us. <clears throat> he experienced relational brokenness and betrayal. He experienced loneliness and grief and waves of deep sadness. Being fully human, he experienced it, and being fully God, he defeated it. In a cradle in Bethlehem, he was born. That was his birthplace, and his death place was a cross at Golgotha. Beaten beyond recognition, he dragged across outside of the walls of Jerusalem to the scene of his execution. Being fully man, he hung on that cross, and he died, and he was placed in the tomb. But being fully God, three days later, he emerged from that tomb alive. And that same power that raised him from the dead is available to you today. That same healing power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you today through him. Whether you are in need of spiritual healing or relational healing or physical or emotional healing, when you choose Christmas, you choose a Savior that is mighty to save. Man, some of you, you that's what you needed to hear today. You can be healed. Healing is a gift from the Lord. You know, this past summer, Elders Council... Um, the Elders Council, sort of my direct reports, they encouraged me to take a four-week sabbatical, um, late July, early August. And I'll go into a little bit of detail um, in, in week three of this series. But for many reasons, at that moment, that season of my life, I was, my soul was really dry. 
coming off of a, a really tough season, I needed a long, cool drink of water. And if you recall, like, late July, early August, it was hot. Anybody, you can, I mean, I know we're not experiencing it right now, but think back. It was hot. It was smoking hot those days in, in July. And that's when I had my sabbatical. And one afternoon, I took a Bible and, and my journal, and I went to Moraine State Park, you know, just up, up the, uh, the road from here. And my plan was to find a quiet place by the lake, sit down and read. You know, I had set a goal for myself that I was going to read the New Testament three times through in three different translations over those three weeks. So I sat there on a picnic table. The day previous to that, I had actually texted Kent and said, man, do you have a couple good worship CD re recommendations? I just needed something new to listen to. And, and he gave me an artist by the name of Chris McClarney that I had previously never really listened to. And sitting on that picnic table at that very hot day, I played a, a worship CD from Chris McClarney and I pulled out my journal. And I just got to tell you, what I did in those next few moments is just poured out my heart to God. And it wasn't some loud verbal thing. It was some writing and some praying, but it was really raw and it was really honest of what was on my heart. And I just got to say that, you know, and I don't want to hyper-spiritualize any, anything or weird anybody out here, but God met me right there. Because a, a cool, slight breeze picked up. And I could see, like, the grass moving and the leaves rustling in the, tw in the trees. But just like 20 yards over there, it wasn't. And I, and I wasn't, like, scared. or. And I just sort of quieted my heart, and I heard in my heart nothing. You know, it wasn't thunder from heaven or anything. It was just, shh, just listen. And I tuned in then to the song that was playing. And, and the lyrics read or said, there's healing, there's freedom, there's more than enough for everyone. And then Chris McClarney raised his voice and said, so we come, Lord, we come. And that breeze stopped. And it just was. It, it just was God. I didn't make a big deal out of it. It just was a moment. And three things happened there. One, instantly my soul was set free. It was refreshed and, and restored. And, and hear me, not everything that was burdening me was, was gone like the next day. I still had to walk through, and some tough things still happened. But my soul was restored. Secondly, this series was birthed. You know, we had sort of a concept, but we didn't have the, the themes. And I, in my journal that day, in that moment, wrote healing, freedom, joy, and forgiveness. And I brought it to the teaching team when I got back. And the third thing was, and this might be a little bit harder to define, I just, received, I just sort of had this strong sense from God that Northway, if we choose Christmas this December, he, he wants to bring an incredible amount of joy and freedom and forgiveness and hear this, healing to us, to you this season. He, he wants to do something amazing. And I'm not going to go into it, but our pastors have been praying for you for quite some time. Our elders have been praying and will be up front after every service throughout this season to pray with you. And we have already begun to hear miracle stories of healing. Miracle stories of restoration and relationships. Wise men and women in this room. Maybe those of you that didn't grow up in or around the church. God has been seeking you. Walk that short six-mile walk to Jerusalem and find that Savior that was born in Bethlehem. You have come so far, somehow, in some way. You know that he is real. I just want to speak this over you. Come drink from the well that never runs dry. There is rest here in the arms of Christ, and all who seek him will surely find him.
shepherds in this room, some of you that have grown up in church families, right, in Christian families, and for whatever reason, you've sort of walked away or pushed that relationship aside. God is seeking your return. Take that short walk from the deep darkness of that field into that little town of Bethlehem. It's a short little walk. Find that Savior in that manger in Bethlehem. For you, if you're thirsty, come. There is mercy. And man, hear this. It doesn't matter what you've done. There is rest here in the arms of Christ. And all who seek will surely find him. I'm going to ask our bands to, to, to come out now. And, and um, we're going to close this time um, by singing that song together. It's a song by Chris McClarney called Thirsty. And um, Phil is going to lead us through it. And I would just encourage you that maybe for you it's just focusing on the lyrics. Maybe for you it's like you need to make a declaration and sing this out. Maybe it's just a quietness so that you can hear something in your deep soul from the Lord in this moment. But here's what I know. He wants to heal something in you right now, in, in this moment, there's something that needs healed. And he is mighty to do it. So Father God, we give you just this four minutes. And would you speak to us? Would you work in our hearts and in our souls? Would you work in those dry and thirsty spots? God, you are a gentle, respectful God. God, right now, I would ask that you would speak to us in your son's name. Amen.